Melissa, I love you. So big. My doom. That's not actually the worst poem ever invented. It's the name of the four first big viruses that ever came out. Melissa, in 1999, infected an estimated 20% of computers worldwide. The following year, I Love You came out. Who remembers I Love You? I'm showing my age, as are a couple of you. We had My Doom in 2003 and in 2004, sorry, we had So Big in 2003. 2004, we had My Doom, which caused an estimated $38 billion of damage worldwide. Viruses are nasty. So I'm going to be one of those people that asks you all to stand. I mean it. So because we're talking about a virus today, I need you all to take a pledge. <laughs> so I'd like you to, to repeat after me. I, insert your name, uh, pledge to use the following information for good. If I fail to uphold this pledge, I promise to commit 200 hours of community service. <laughs> now please remain standing for a second. I want to use this opportunity to thank the organizers, Michael and the team, for an absolutely fantastic conference. It's no small feat to put that kind of thing together. So could you all give me a round of applause? Thank you very much. I'm going to post that photo later and say I got a standing ovation. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, I don't want to go, my slideshow is very short. I want to give you a demo. I'm going to actually write a virus for you today um, and take you through the processes. But before we do that, let's have a quick think about what a virus is. Um, so, a virus essentially has three main components. You have the infection mechanism. How does the virus get into a system? You have a payload, which is the actual virus that you want to infect a system with. And then you have a trigger, which is a mechanism by which the virus then actually gets actioned in order to take over a system or um, get information out of a database or whatever it is uh, that you're trying to do. Now, if you're a virus writer, which you all are, right? If you're a virus writer, you're going to be concerned about the systems that detect viruses. Antivirus is a, a huge, big global uh, industry, as evidenced by the, the number of options out there and the number of viruses we still get infected by. Um, so what do they do? Um, essentially, some of the ways that they will look for a virus is by uh, detecting a spread. So, uh, files being updated, um, a network uh, socket being opened in order to uh, write files to separate systems that perhaps is out of the norm. Um, they will look for analysis detections. Instead of writing to files, maybe lots of files being opened and read and being analyzed. Maybe they're trying to exfiltrate information out of your systems. Are they stealing resources? Has your CPU usage just skyrocketed because this thing's running in the background? Or have you run out of memory because this massive, uh, probably badly written script is running out of control? Um, so in order to escape these kind of mechanisms, what we will do is we'll, uh, we'll know that we're looking for patterns. So the best uh, security defense mechanisms will look at uh, patterns in order to, to monitor whether or not something is astray. You'll find this often in airports. Um, there are often people around just monitoring people, how they walk around, uh, the kind of uh, activities they're doing, who they're talking to, whether they have multiple laptops, which a lot of conference presenters here uh, may or may not be flagged for in certain country uh, security databases. Um, but by trying not to stand out from the crowd in our script, we can try and evade that system. Uh, we can also adapt and evolve. Maybe the script changes over time. A, 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 uh, a script that changes and doesn't look the same every time is harder to detect. Um, we can obfuscate ourselves by making it look less like a script or an attack. And in fact, sometimes we can even scramble ourselves completely, and today we'll be using encryption to make sure that it's not actually possible to tell what the virus is. Um, the best way to get into a system is to act benign. If you see a big wooden horse outside your door, of course you're going to invite it in. Who wouldn't? It's a big wooden horse. Um, but once it's in, the wooden horse lays dormant for a while. It also turns into a cat. Who doesn't like cats? So you lay dormant for a while, and when you do activate, you take it slow. Don't stand out. So that's enough about that. Let's actually write a virus. So I have... I'd better stop the presentation so that comes up. I have... Oh. 
stop the presentation so that doesn't come up. Excellent. I like it when computers listen to what you're doing. So let's have a look over here. So can everybody read that at the back? Can anybody not read that at the back? That's probably a better question. No, good. All right. I'm going to um, crane my neck a little here while I try and see what I'm doing. So I've got um, a number of steps here that I'm going to take you through uh, the process that I wrote a virus. So uh, quite aptly, I believe, I called the virus boom.php because we're going to make something go boom. So let's have a look what we have to start with. I have to stay here because of the microphone and the recording. So let's have a look here. Well, what we've got is we've got a system that's going to look for all the PHP files in the system. It's going to go through each of those files and is going to open it in read mode. Now, the reason we're opening it in read mode and not write mode, because remember, we're writing a virus to this file now, is that um, sometimes there can be uh, issues with going into read write mode on certain file systems. We want to make sure that we don't have a conflict or uh, the ability for a system to pick up the fact that we're modifying files. So we're going to read the file. It's quite a normal operation. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we'll see here that we're going to uh, open another file with the same file name but with .infected on the end. So essentially the process here is we're going to read from one file, we're going to write into another file, but the other file is going to be infected with some kind of payload. So down further at the bottom of the screen here, we can see that we put into the string an infection, which at the moment is just a, um, a comment essentially. So we've put in a PHP tag there with a comment file infected. It's pretty inane at the moment, but we'll make it a bit more interesting later. Down at the bottom here, after we've written the first line to the infected file, we then go through the input file and we write all of the other files out. So essentially what we've got now is we've got our original file, we've got our new file, into the new file we've written an infection, and then line by line we copy the whole original file into the new file. Yeah? So then if we scroll down a little, we'll see that after we've uh, finished writing this in, we then close both of the files, we delete the original and we rename the infected file to the original file name. So now we've effectively replaced the original file without ever having opened it in read-write mode, which is going to reduce the likelihood of a antivirus system detecting the fact that we changed a file. Hopefully, we'll see. So let's have a, have a look and see how that works. So I have in here, so we've got our boom file, which we just looked at, and I also have a file called example.php, which is very complicated. I'll just run it, because I don't want to go through every line of code. So we have there the numbers 1 through 9. That's exactly what we expected. So let's run the boom file now. And nothing happens. That's as expected. As, as uh, a virus writer, you want to make sure there's no visual side effect to the fact that you've disinfected a system. And now if we run the example file again, it still echoes the numbers 1 through 9. But if we look at the example file, we can see at the top there the file has now been affected. The infection mechanism has worked. Let's have a look at step two. So this is pretty much the same file, except now I've wrapped the whole thing into an execute function. The reason for this is that I don't just want to put a comment in saying file infected, because that's kind of boring and it doesn't serve any purpose for an evil hacker like me. So I actually want to pass in the virus that's going to be run as, or inserted into the destination files. The rest of the code down here is the same, except down here uh, we write the virus in to the infected, uh, the, the new file, the dot .infected file. And then down at the bottom we have uh, the, the renaming of the files, but then right at the end here we have an extra four lines. So what we're doing is we're creating the uh, virus variable, which is the contents of the current file. Double underscore file, double underscore is a reference to the file that's currently running. So boom.php is going to get the contents of boom.php and it's going to add it uh, to the, uh, assign the, the data to the virus variable and that then gets passed into execute down here. Now, one of the issues with that is that we have a start PHP tag at the beginning and a close PHP tag at the end and we've got a whole lot of other code in there that we actually don't want to infect the file with because that's going to break the original PHP file. If you have an open PHP tag followed by an open PHP tag and two closed PHP tags, that's going to break. Or at the very least, it's going to provide an output that alerts the user or the, the, the person running the script that uh, something slightly dodgy is going on. So you'll notice here that we're looking for uh, a, a line that says virus start and virus end. If we scroll up to the top again, you'll see that I added a virus start at the top. If we scroll to the bottom, you'll see virus end. So essentially what we're doing is we're finding the positions of these two markers and we're making sure that they are now the start and the end of the actual virus. So we're cutting out everything outside of it. 
We've now got control of exactly what, what goes into the file. Is that making sense? So if we have a look at our example file again, it's uninfected at the moment. If we run our boom file, when we look at our example file again there, we've got the virus. And you can see the virus starters up there, but the original PHP open tag isn't. If you scroll down to the bottom, you can see that the end virus tag is there, but the original code, code still exists. So now, now we have a virus in the example script. So let's create a new file, foo.php. Did I get that right? I did. Typing in front of conferences. Always tricky. Right, so if I run foo, we should get hello php conf asia. If I run example, we still get one through nine. And now if we look at foo, foo has now also been infected. So it's actually a proper virus now. It's infecting and it's infecting and it's infecting again. Um, so the next step that we want to do is that script is obviously, like if you looked at that or you had any kind of semantic analysis in an antivirus system, look at that code. Notwithstanding the fact that the word virus is all the way through it, you would probably be able to guess that it's a virus. Um, there's certain aspects of that that a, an antivirus system would pick up on. So let's encrypt the virus completely so that uh, an analyzer that wasn't able to decrypt. Yes? Uh, Boom.php will also be uh, infected again. And we'll come to that in the next step. It's a great question. So because Boom.php infected example, an example then infected foo. Example would also have reinfected boom and it would have reinfected example. And in step four, we'll find out a way to stop that issue happening. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to uh, go through the encryption process. So, get the cursor back to the right place. Step three. So, what are we going to be doing here? So, the virus that was passed through at the top there is still being passed through. And then you'll notice down here where we're adding the virus into the file, we're passing it through another method, another function called encrypted, encrypt virus. We want to take the virus and we want to encrypt it. And then further down in the code, we skip down, we'll see the encrypted virus. I won't go through too much on exactly how mcrypt works. Um, and for those of you who are into security and encryption, you'll probably know that mcrypt is not the best function to use nowadays for encryption. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not actually doing this because we want, want to encrypt data for security. We're encrypting it because we want to obfuscate it against antivirus systems. So we're going to create ourselves a key. We're going to create an initialization vector, and we call the mcrypt encrypt function uh, to create an encrypted version of the virus. So if any of you have ever worked with encryption before, you'll probably know that the information that gets put into that encrypted virus variable is not, ASCII, uh, is not actually ASCII anymore. It's going to be a binary data blob, essentially. And that's a very hard thing to put into um, a file that could traverse different file systems that you want to be able to interpret and decrypt in certain ways. Uh, we want to provide uh, an encoded method of, pro of passing this information around uh, that can also be put into an ASCII file without drawing too much attention. If you have a whole data blob inside a PHP file, that's probably going to draw attention to uh, antivirus systems as well. And remember, we want to lay low. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to base64 encode all three variables. We're going to take the, encoded vi uh, the encrypted virus, the initialization vector, and the key. Now, if I wanted to send you a secure message, we might have a pre-shared key, or maybe we're using public-private encryption. I would send you the encrypted data only. I wouldn't share with you the, the key that I use to encrypt it in a public channel, because obviously then anybody could decrypt it. So if you're writing a secure system, don't publish the key. But if you're writing a virus, it's totally fine. So we're going to take these, we're going to add them into these encoded variables here, and then we're going to generate a string. So remember, we want to write a string into every PHP file in the system that is a virus. So at the moment, we have a load of data that we need to put into the, the, the virus, but we don't actually want to run it at the moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a string, which is basically PHP within a string, which will later get evaluated. 
eval is evil. That's why a lot of viruses get through. Um, so don't, don't enable eval unless you actually need it on your production environment. Um, but in here, we're, we're going to pass in the, the three variables we've just encoded, and we're going to write the decryption PHP into the string. So it's not actually decrypting at this point, it's just generating the code that will later decrypt the virus again. Does that make sense? Great. And then we basically, uh, we also include in there the eval and the execute that are again in the string, so that's going to get run later, and we return the new payload. So the virus that now gets inserted should be encrypted. So if we look at our example file again, it's just echo one through nine, and if I run boom, we now have this instead of the original virus. So we've got the encrypted virus, the IV and the key, which are base64 encoded bits of information. And then we determine that the virus can be decrypted by using the key, the encrypted virus, and the IV, all gone through the base64 decode method. So it gets turned back into the binary equivalents of what we needed. And then we have virus now contains the original string of the virus, which was the original file from boom.php. We can then evaluate that, which means that we now have an execute function in memory and we can execute the virus, which will then infect the other files. But by looking at this, again, other than the fact that the word virus exists everybody, everywhere in there, um, you can't tell readily that it is actually a virus. Um, I, would, I would recommend if you do plan on doing this and putting it into production, first of all, don't tell me, don't tell anybody else, um, but also don't call it encrypted virus. It's a dead giveaway. So the question that I had earlier was what happens to boom.php. If we look at boom.php now, we can see that uh, the encrypted virus is at the top because boom.php infected itself. And if we scroll down a bit further, you can see that the original text is in there because that was the original unencrypted virus that was in boom.php in the first place. If I edit foo.php, I'm going to make my life easier this time. So now if I run, so we know that um, boom is double infected. We know that uh, example has been infected. We just saw that. We've now got foo, which has not been infected yet. So if I run example, I'm just going to clear it to get it to the top. Uh, it helps if I type PHP properly. Uh, you can see that one through nine has come out. We've got no side effects, so the original intent is there. We know there was an encrypted virus inside example.php. And if we now look at foo.php, we can see that foo has been encrypted as well. But if we look at example alongside it, we can see that there's the encrypted virus there once. And if we scroll down a bit further, there's the encrypted virus there again. Which means that if I run example again, do we know what's going to happen? Execute has been defined twice now, because it's in there twice, it's been decoded twice, and then suddenly you can't, you can't have the execute function in the same namespace twice. So we get an error, and obviously that's something we don't want to do. We've now got a virus that will infect your whole system, but echo errors everywhere. So how do we get around that? We get around that with step four, of course. That's the answer. So let's have a look at what we do in step four. So we've got the execute function here at the top here. We're going through all the PHP files, and we go through them. Uh, we want to check that it's not infected. So what we do is we get the first line of the script. And the idea is we're going to put a marker in there of some sort to define whether or not it's been infected. We then generate a, a hash, which is an MD5 of the file name. And that's basically going to be what we use as a marker. And if the, the first line of the virus contains the hash, or in this case, because it's false, if it does not contain the hash, we can assume the file has not been infected. So if we scroll down, we'll then see that what we're going to do is we create the infected file as we did before, and then we write a first line here, which is checksum, followed by the virus hash. So we're going to write that in as the first line on the infected file. And then we write in the first line from the infection. Now, because we read the first line, before what we were doing is we were adding in the first line, and then we were basically doing read, write, read, write, read, write, read, write. But because we've read the first line already, that's been consumed. Therefore, the file pointer is now pointing the second line. So the first line that we got from the original file, we need to make sure we put that into the, the new infected file first before we lose it. And then we can carry on with our loop. 
So we put in the checksum, we put in the infection, and then we put in the first line that we get grabbed just up at the top there. And then we can carry on through the rest of the file and write that into the new infected file. We close the files, we delete the original, and we rena rename the infected one. So now if we look at the output of PHP boom, we get nothing. We look at the content of example, and we can see the virus in there. If I run PHP boom again now, uh, this is actually an issue because uh, boom.php didn't have the checksum at the top. But if I run example again, because example does have the hash at the top, we can run that as often as we want and it's not going to reinfect itself. If I edit foo, check your coding. There we go. That. So foo at the moment just echoes out an at. If we run example, again, we don't get any errors. If we look at example, there's only one virus. If we look at foo, there's only one virus. If we run foo, there's no errors. So we've now got a virus that's infected both example and foo. They're not uh, infecting themselves again, in effect, because foo ran and example was already infected, it also didn't reinfect the example file. So I think we've got a pretty robust uh, virus here now that we can try and upload into a system uh, that's not going to cause any side effects in terms of the user realizing that something's going on. Anything that infects will carry on doing exactly what it did before, either the numbers one through nine or an at or whatever we're looking at. Um, so I think the best thing to do is to try and find uh, the infection mechanism there. So we've got the virus, we've got the payload. We'll look at a trigger soon. We need an infection mechanism. So to do this, I wrote a, um, because every, every good developer writes everything from scratch themselves, right? By the way, you'll notice here um, the directory name, Vagrant. I'm running all of this in a virtual box. I've learned from experience that when writing viruses that infect PHP files, not to do it on your host machine, unless you're absolutely sure that everything's committed to Git. <laughs> if there's one lesson I can give you today, that's probably the one. So um, I have this very simple uh, gallery system, which you can see right here. So simple, it uses Bootstrap because I'm not a front-end developer. Uh, and it contains three files. So we've got our index file. So what I wanted to do by generating, uh, by creating this very simple gallery, was to create something that used a lot of best practices in terms of security to make sure that nothing can get in that shouldn't be able to get in. So in order to generate the front page, we've got a whole lot of HTML here. Um, but the main point of interest is this part here. So we've got a... Uh, for each here, which goes through gallery images, which is a directory that's outside of the document root. You'll notice the dot dot slash. So you can't actually get to these images directly through, through the browser. So it goes through all the files in that directory and grabs out the image name. And then it'll pass that image name into the show image PHP file as a parameter called file name. So we're making sure that we're using, because obviously the browser can't access the file directly, we need a, a helper PHP script to grab the data and send it back to the browser. But in that PHP script, we'll be able to put some more validation in to make sure that the image is something we actually want to display. Let's have a look at that file. So we have a system here that, first of all, is going to check the referrer. If you're submitting a file uh, from another system, we don't want any cross-site uh, image injection. If, I think I just coined a new term, cross-site image injection. Is that a thing? It is now. Um, so we, we check that the referrer is who we're expecting it to be. We then make sure the file name is sane. So we're going to make sure it's only got alphanumeric letters, um, dots and dashes and stuff, but no slashes, so you can't escape out of directories by passing in dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, whatever else. Uh, and then we make sure that the gallery images directory is prefixed in front of it. So you've got your file name. We've made sure there's no silly characters in it. We prefix it with dot, dot, slash, galleries. That's now a known good pointer to an image that should exist in gallery images. We make sure that the file MIME type is what we're expecting. So we take the, uh, the image type from the file name and we check it against, uh, where do we check it? Maybe it's a bit further down. 
Oh, no, sorry. What we do is we take the MIME type and we echo, that, echo it out as a header. So we actually check the MIME type is something we like when we upload the image. But we take the image and we say, is it a JPEG or a PNG or whatever, and we make sure that header is sent to the browser first, because obviously a PHP script is going to return um, an HTML MIME type header by default. So we make sure that the MIME type is correct for the image, and then we include the file name, which is basically going to take the data of the, of the image and push it straight out to the browser. Yeah? So let's just have a look at how files are uploaded. Similarly, we have our acceptable MIME types up here. So we've got PNG, uh, JPEG, GIF, and a few others. Uh, we make sure that, first of all, the file has been uploaded. There's no point in trying to process a file that doesn't exist. Uh, we check the MIME type. We make sure that it's in this acceptable MIME types array. We then use the same regular expression to make sure the file name is sane. And we move the file into the gallery images directory. And then we send the person back to the home directory, or the, the home page. All make sense? Nice and secure? No bugs in there at all? <laughs> well, says Rasmus, well. <laughs> so let's have a look at what happens. So we'll jump over to, and actually the first thing we need to do is I have this uh, image called bread.jpg. Uh, and if we look over here, Oh, I need to click on the browse button, Benjamin. So we have in talks. I can't actually see that very well. Files, images, bread. So you can see that the preview we've got bread.jpg. Um, but the first thing we're going to do infected. How many people here understand the, f uh, the file format of a JPEG file? A couple. So I'll, I'll show you. Interestingly, Vim doesn't autocomplete JPEG when you're trying to edit a file. Um, but I am going to Vim hmm? minus B. Huh? Uh, where am I going? Uh, do I want to edit it in binary mode? Oh, I just want the autocomplete. So I still want to edit it in, in ASCII mode. Yeah. So I'm going to Vim uh, files images, and yet autocomplete for bread doesn't work because apparently they think that you don't want to edit uh, binary files in non-binary mode in Vim. But here we have uh, in ASCII mode our uh, JPEG file. Now you'll notice at the top there's uh, a first line which contains JFIF and a whole lot of other information. You've got the creator JPEG, uh, you've got somewhere in there, it might be off the end of the line, the, the quality like 70% or whatever quality, the, the, that's basically the first line header. And everything after that is the binary data for the uh, JPEG file itself. So one thing you can do is if I grab our boom file. So I'm currently on the first line there. I'm just going to hit paste. I'm going to stick a PHP script directly into the JPEG file. Now, some of you might think, well, that's all very well, because I imagine at some point it's probably going to be executed and will be taken out again by the PHP uh, interpreter, which means the JPEG will still run fine. But the thing that I found interesting when I was creating this is that if we just go back, just to make sure it's refreshed, the preview of that file still looks like bread. So even with a PHP in there, and this works on Linux as well, I haven't tested on Windows, but Linux and Mac OS, will still preview the file without any issue. So you can infect an image, give it to somebody else, and they might not even know there's got an infection inside it, which I think is kind of cool. So let's select that file and upload it. And here now we have bread. So bread file has been successfully uploaded, um, moved into the gallery images directory. Gallery images, we now have bread.jpg in there. If we look at bread.jpg, which is not in that directory, we can confirm, I think it just slid off the top there. Well, this is a fun presentation. Look at that. Everybody's going a little bit. There we go. There's the code. So we've got our infection in the JPEG file. Um, if we now go back into the www directory and look at the index file, we can see there's a virus in there. Because as the bread file got uploaded, it then got displayed on the main page and it got infected. Can anybody think why that executed? I used include. 
So even though I check the MIME type, so I put it outside of the file directory, the, the document root, and I made sure that the MIME type header was sent in properly, include will actually execute any PHP in the file that it brings in, as well as then uh, echo anything out to the browser. So you can be secure by one small misstep. Um, and often we can find this in uh, everyday applications nowadays. WordPress gets a lot of bad rep. The WordPress core itself is actually pretty well, well I shouldn't say actually, that sounds condescending. It is a, a, a pretty well written tool, but the problem with WordPress and a lot of systems like it is the third party plugin community. So the plugins themselves, again, are perfectly well written most of the time. But as soon as you get two plugins that kind of clash with each other, you can get some really interesting side effects. And I found one about four or five years ago where uh, there was an image manipulation tool and a WYSIWYG editor. And because of the way that they used data in different ways and escaped data in different ways, you had an injection attack vulnerability. So you could actually upload a file, much similar to the way we have bread.jpg here, with PHP in it and it would get executed. So it wasn't that WordPress was insecure, it wasn't that either of the plugins themselves were insecure, but the combination of the three, written by three different sets of development teams, is what caused the issue. So we have to be very... Uh, how many people here will take a third-party library through NPM or Composer or um, whatever platform you're using and do a full code audit through their security team on it? Yeah, nor me. We don't have time for that. So even though the, um, the premise of this script, there's some fallacies in the fact that, sure, include um, a, an average developer might notice that that's the issue. Uh, we can't always know what other scripts are running in, in our ecosystem within our applications. Um, so what I'd like to do now, now that we've, we've uh, got, got an infection in there, is have a bit of fun with it. So you might have noticed that I actually loaded Boom from step five. I put an extra bit of code in step five's Boom, uh, which means that I can now run things like Let's go to browser. So I'm not sure if you can read that at the back, but it'll come up in larger text soon. But essentially, I'm passing in a query string uh, with a, a key of eval and the value of PHP info. So essentially, the code that I've uploaded has a, a little switch in there saying, if the eval parameter is passed, then evaluate whatever's passed in, which is a perfect virus, because then you can run whatever you want here. Yeah? So you can see there, PHP info at the top left. That's basically echoing exactly what came in. WordPress. <laughs> Not the vulnerability that I was testing the other day, which I'm still trying to get into this demo. Um, the other thing you can do is something like this. Now, this takes a little while because I don't actually have a mail server running on my virtual machine at the moment. Um, but in a second, it should fail and tell you that I just tried to send an email to myself. So I'm sending myself spam. So if you infected a whole of servers, you, you could then use it as an email spam mechanism, as long as they obviously had uh, SMGP mail configure, configured. Um, but the most fun one is probably uh, hijacking a website altogether. So this one here doesn't do anything visual, other than the fact that it prints it out at the top there because my virus prints it out. But your virus doesn't have to print out the fact that it's affecting something. But if we follow this through, essentially we're going to create a new file called a.php. Because remember, again, I was saying before, sometimes you can't actually edit a file uh, on, on certain file systems. In this case, because index.php is actually in memory and open the file, there might be a file lock on it. So we can't edit the file itself that's running. So we create an a.php file to start with. And we create a variable called header, and into that we put in location 2018 php confluent asia. And then into a, in, into index.php, we write that as the header. So a.php is now going to contain PHP, and that PHP is going to change index. Does that make sense? So now, if I go to a.php, it doesn't look like it's done anything, because that script that we just saw up there doesn't have any side effect, well, other than editing index.php. But if I know, now go back to the home page, I've completely hijacked the website and taken us to the PHP conference website. So you could use this to just do whatever you want to anybody's website. There are certain precautions you can take, such as uh, making sure that the files aren't writable by the web directory, uh, by the, the web user. Um, but yeah, that's the virus in a nutshell.
and I'll press the wrong button, which means it started the presentation from the beginning again. We probably can probably take one or two questions. Ah, uh, in a second. So payload ideas, we've already oh. just had a look at the eval. Now you could have one eval that basically runs whatever you like, but you might want to contain the, the virus and, and constrain what it can actually do. Um, so some other ideas that some people at other conferences have come up with was uh, a dedicated DDoS system, uh, which basically will request files from a remote system. Uh, so you've got this drone attack to take somebody else down. Uh, the most interesting idea was somebody saying, well, why don't you just host a JSON file that contains a whole lot of commands so that these drones just basically pull uh, a command list and execute those. And you can have a switch statement in there saying if the command is DDoS, then DDoS that. And so you could mix that with a whole lot of evals and, and create um, JSON or YAML for viruses, which could be kind of cool. We should standardize that. I think, I think that needs some RFCs around it. Um, but ultimately, why am I telling you this? So we, we all took a pledge at the beginning. Uh, writing viruses is not the best thing to do if you want a harmonious and peaceful life and humanity. Uh, so why am I telling you about writing viruses? The reason why I started doing this was because um, I talk about security and privacy quite a bit. And one of the things that I've always tried to do is to help people understand how best to secure the systems. And I thought, well, if we can actually think like a hacker, if we can think like an evil person, Surely that's going to give us the, the opposite side of the, the, the coin. We can think, if I wanted to break the system, how would I do it and protect yourself in that way? Oftentimes we'll put a lot of layers of security in, which is not a bad thing, but they usually, they, they can tend to be in areas that maybe aren't the most risk, uh, the, the, the areas that you need to, to fix of highest risk. There might be higher risk areas somewhere else. So evaluating your system from uh, a negative Mind space, head space, can allow you to think of areas to uh, focus your, your time and attention on in better ways. But ultimately, the main reason I did this is because I want to get my hands dirty and play with something new. And I think as developers, we can often uh, day to day get stuck in the, the work we're doing. And sure, we get some R&D time every now and then, but we need to play with other things. And I think by writing a virus, that's not something we would do in our day job. Does anybody write viruses as their day job? No. Does anybody write viruses at their day job but they don't want to admit to it? <laughs> uh, so um, I think we need to play more. We, we need to go outside of our, our normal day-to-day -day box. Um, if it's a new language or even a new construct or a new way of thinking, um, I'd like to encourage you all to take that mind space, especially through this, this conference. Uh, when you're seeing other talks in areas that perhaps you haven't touched on before, um, take that learning away and, and play in ways that you haven't before after you leave the conference. Um, so, remember your pledge, and thank you very much. Um, so, in order to protect myself, is there any kind of, um, I don't even know how to do it, but like any way to check some, each of your PHP files so that um, prior to execution, um, there be a checksum to verify that the file has not been altered? If so, if you want to protect your file from change, the first best way to do it is to make sure that the, the web user can't change the files. If you're in a situation where you can't do that for, for certain reasons, um, one reason, for example, that people keep their WordPress files writable is because WordPress has a self-update mechanism. Uh, the, you've then got the question of, do I want to stay up to date and secure, or do I want to make sure that nobody can change my files? So there's a, a balance there that you need to, to um, take into account. If you did have a mechanism for putting a checksum into a file to check before execution, you have to remember that the virus could change that checksum if it's aware of the system that's in place. Um, one method that I have seen used, uh, if you're looking at wanting to keep your files writable because you want automatic update systems, um, a colleague of mine many years ago ran a WordPress hosting platform. And essentially, he would keep a like a gold server, the, the, the main top level server that was the most up to date information, and that would not be accessible via the web. And it had files that were writable by the www data uh, user. When WordPress came out with an update, it would automatically update it and it would commit that into the Git repository. And then all of the slave web servers would pull from that Git repository into a document route that wasn't writable by the www data user, which meant that they were getting the benefits of the real time updates. But if a virus did infect those systems, they wouldn't be able to infect the files. So there are ways around it in terms of um, deployment processes and 
Uh, but I, I probably wouldn't recommend going down the path of implementing a checksum mechanism, just because that adds extra maintenance and uh, overhead, and potentially another uh, security vulnerability in that. Isn't like a eval usually disabled by default or something like in most shared? Depends on the PHP version you're running. <laughs> okay. It also also depends on the hosting environment. If you're in shared hosting environments, for example, then perhaps it could be different. Um, the, if you have total control of your environment, sure, you can probably guarantee that eval is disabled. Uh, but again, eval isn't the only way of getting a virus into the system either. It's just the way I used it. One last question. Anyone? Any budding virus writers around here? No? Yes? Okay. Well, I'm going to be around for the rest of the conference anyway, so come up and have a chat with me. That'd be great. Thanks.